I did have a phase where I sort of wanted to not be seen as a youth. Like, even when, you know, like when I was going to COP24, I was so desperate for people to take me seriously. And in my work for Climate Tracker, I really wanted people to take me seriously that I identified as, you know, freelance writer and journal and like climate tracker person from Saigon rather than youth climate advocate from Saigon. Yeah, because I was afraid that, that, you know, being so obviously a youth, I guess, um, could, like we talked about this, right? Like the assumptions that people make. Um, but definitely my engagement with UNDP Vietnam and the Youth for Climate Network kind of recently has re- like convince me that yes I can embrace my youth identity mm. and it still works out <laughs> Life fly. hello everyone my name is Dean Long and welcome to the podcast Lifeline In this podcast, I will interview people who are having a positive impact in their community and have a strong message that deserves to be shared. We will dive deeper into their journey becoming a change maker, and hopefully you can take away some insights for your own journey. And please do subscribe to Lifeline on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or any platform that you are using. And also you can share this episode with your friends if you like it. It's really what helps me the most. Mai is a climate journalist and youth advocate from Vietnam. She writes poetry about mosquitoes, trained aspiring climate journalist, and has coordinated the first ever special report on youth climate action in Vietnam with UNDP Vietnam. She shares with us the start of her climate advocacy at 13 years old, her experience as the youngest climate tracker journalism fellow at the 24th UN Climate Change Conference, or COP24, and how she's been moving towards youth empowerment and engagement with the Youth for Climate Network. We discuss how she trained herself to become a journalist, her challenges as a youth, and how she reconnected with her youth identity, and all the small moments that made a difference in her life. This is the longest episode of Lifeline so far. It's around 2 hours and 10 minutes, so enjoy and see you in a while. Cool. Hello, hello Mai, hello Mai Huang. Um, super happy to have you on Lifeline Podcast today. Um, yeah, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling awesome. Hello, Dingo. Thanks for inviting me cool. to your podcast. Yes, I think, uh, you know, so I had the idea to invite you for a long time. And after, so I'll just remind a bit how we know each other. So what I say makes sense for everyone. But I think, how do I know you actually? Oh, yeah, no, it's from the <laughs> Indo-Pacific. Yes. Dialogue. Yes, I remember. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I, I don't even remember what I. Oh yeah, it was about social entrepreneurship and young people. So I got invited to speak there, and I was so excited to see delegates from Vietnam as well. Um, so I think yeah, I think we just added each other on Facebook. Then I was following what you were doing. I was like, oh, she's from Climate Tracker. I heard about it. I want to know more about Climate Tracker. So. We had a call about that. And at the same time, everything happened really like in parallel. Uh, yeah, everyone in UNDP Vietnam was like, you have to invite Mai Huang as a speaker. I was like, oh, it's perfect coincidence. I'm speaking to her tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, all the dots connected. And you know, after, so I, we invited you as a speaker for two sessions. So one, you were explaining about the, uh, with your life basically mm -hmm. like a mini version of lifeline very tiny version of mm -hmm. your life and the other you were sharing about the special report you are leading we'll come back to this hopefully today but yeah anyway during i just want to share that during the session i think every time you spoke like really the chat went crazy but i think more than other speakers i think that was amazing in the feedback form also. I told that by messenger, I want to, but I want to say it out loud as well. But yes, so many, you know, we asked this question, what is one speaker that inspired you? So many people said my Huang, Huang, my, like all the possible combinations of your name. <laughs> Someone even said, okay. the Vietnamese girl who's a journalist, but I don't remember her name. <laughs> I guess it was you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then Linka kept telling me, yeah, 
I want to hear my Huang in Lifeland podcast. I'm like, yes, I mean, actually, that's how the plan. So, okay, let's just do this as quickly as possible. Um, okay, so that was a lot of momentum building for everyone and the long intro, but yeah. <laughs> no uh, pressure, right? <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just invite you if you want to introduce yourself, where you're calling mm-hmm. from, and who is my Huang. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Mai Huang. Um, first name is mine. Last name is Huang. It gets very confusing because, well, I went to school in the U.S. for a while, but in Vietnam, the name is last name before first name. So even Vietnamese people get confused about whether my name is Mai or Huang, but you can call me Mai. Um, and I'm recording right now in my bedroom in Saigon, Vietnam, which is where I'm from. And yeah, I mostly grew up here. <laughs> Cool. Um, I so I love reading out loud how people usually introduce themselves on their LinkedIn, on their mm. blogs, on their everything, and I found a lot oh of God, funny is that what stuff. What you're going to be doing now? <laughs> yes. So I have two versions of what I found. One is okay. Oh, okay. Should I start with the short version or the okay? Let's start with the short version, but. The, the, version, the Facebook version is, I write poetry about mosquitoes. Yes. Would you like to, to elaborate a bit on that? To elaborate on that? Oh, okay. So the story behind that was, um, I started writing poetry when I was around, I think, 13. Yeah, 12 or 13. And especially, I, um, well, I went to boarding school for high school in the U.S. So I was 13, 14 when I'm... I um, was in the U.S. for the first time, and I was terribly homesick because I was pretty much on my own um, in a different country with strange people. It was very strange, <laughs> and I really felt homesick. So that's when I started writing a lot, um, and it was sort of like a way for me to process what I was going through, and um, yeah, it was fun as well. I really enjoyed writing, and then I vividly remember because Vietnam, it you haven't been here yet it's notorious for mosquitoes they're everywhere and especially my house because it's in a pretty suburb like slightly rural area it's still in Saigon like Ho Chi Minh City but not definitely not the city center there's a lot of like trees and um, wild grass and animals around Um, so there's a lot of mosquitoes especially like after around 6 or 7 p.m. Like I cannot sit in the living room because I would get bitten by like 10 mosquitoes. Um, So I always thought of that as a nuisance, of course. But then when I went to the U.S., I realized there were no mosquitoes until May when um, also for context, I went to school in the Northeast. So it's like really cold most of the time. Very, very different climate from Vietnam. So it wasn't until May when like things were blooming, it was finally sunny in spring that some mosquitoes came out. And then I got bitten by one mosquito and I was like, oh my God, mosquito. And I felt so happy. It was really funny. None of my friends could understand why I was so happy to be bitten by a mosquito. But I wrote a whole poem about that. Um, And then I actually, I think I sent it to my English teacher at the time and she really loved it. So, yeah, that's been my Facebook bio ever since I wrote a story about a mosquito. It's so interesting because, I mean, I see like mosquito is like, you know, the symbol of, I mean, symbol of your homesickness to Vietnam. And it's so funny because I, you know, when I read the sentence, I mean, obviously I didn't think about what you just said, but okay, well, I will share with you what I thought when I thought, because you know, in the hot, I mean, we'll come back to that, but in the yeah. hot seat, yeah. you were sharing how you were, so you were sharing like why climate journalism is important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, for you, it's important because you want to highlight human stories and people's stories beyond just fact and figures, even if it's important, you want yeah. people to relate and understand what is the day, like impact in their daily life. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was the more poetry part, you know, like poetry mm-hmm. is like, you know, writing beautiful human stories. 
And I thought mosquitoes were just like the symbol of climate change somehow, in the biodiversity <laughs> nature. So I thought it was like this sentence that really summarized your work with climate tracker, your climate change advocacy. <laughs> But actually, not really. Well, I mean, as time went on, I did sort of the reason why I still kept with that bio. Is that, and I was thinking, yeah, like I think it fits with the. You know, writing and like biodiversity idea as well. But the true origin story was literally I was writing a poem about a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's cool. That、uh, now it's, I mean, sometimes you can just use for different contexts, and you have different stories. <laughs>、mm-hmm. Cool.、Um, okay, so the second. Uh, the second bio. It's not really a bio. Actually, it's very similar to I love it、uh, to. Tuan. So for the record, I interviewed Tuan think,、mm. two Tuan. weeks ago. No, was it Tuan from from Vietnam from Wynet? Oh no, not Tuan. Ah,、uh, Tuan, 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 Tuan Sarzinski. Oh, oh, Tuan Sarzinski. Yes, him. <laughs> Sorry, my Vietnamese accent. <laughs>、um, so he he also writes this on his medium. You know, a lot of different words. Even me a bit、mm-hmm. on my Instagram, random stuff. So I will read yours, and as then I would love. I don't know any funny stories explanation, but yeah.、Mm-hmm. So it's I found it on your personal blog. Very difficult、mm-hmm. to find, but which is oh my, what is that? Freelance writer and journo from Saigon, PEA graduate, ASEAN child, fire horse high, somebody's buito, sustainable virtual investor, happy when house hopping. Aspiring open water diver, learner of human imperfections, lover of greens, an evolving being, and can you do you remember the last one? No. <laughs> okay, it's、uh, currently without affiliations. Twenty twenty one. Oh yes, that was actually kind of funny because I. Immediately after I graduated from high school, I started my gap year before college, right? And I was like, "Yes, finally, I'm not affiliated to any academic institution." And then I changed all of my personal emails to currently without affiliations. But then I realized it wasn't quite true because I'm still working with Climate Tracker up until December. And then, yeah, I guess now you can say I am truly currently without affiliations,、um, but. Do you have questions about that bio?、Um, actually, I have a lot of questions about、okay. this bio.、Uh, I I don't know where to start. Actually,、um, <laughs> wait. Let's. Yeah, I was wondering, like, why did you write ASEAN child and not Vietnamese、mm. child, for example?、Mm. Good question. I think that. A year, so I updated that bio around seven months ago. Definitely a year and a half or two years ago, I would have written Vietnamese child. But then, the more climate change work I did, and also, I think particularly climate tracker was operating a lot on a regional basis. So I had a lot of opportunities to do stuff、um, with people in the Southeast Asia region and sort of think about. The region as a whole and its common challenges and、um, potential, so it just felt more right by the time that I was writing my bio for that、um, for that website to say ASEAN child, and yeah, I think climate change affects all of the ASEAN countries、um, to a very high degree, especially Vietnam and Philippines rank. Consistently as one of the top, like most affected, and Thailand as well.、Um, so, yeah, I think climate ch- working in climate change has pushed me to think about the world in terms of a more regional,、um, like, viewpoint because climate change affects everyone, right?、Mm. Um, so, just saying Vietnamese felt a little bit too. I don't know, like. I'm, I don't want to seem like I'm just working in a box. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, I mean, I find I think that's、uh, that's that. I mean, I was reading everything.、Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's the first thing I made me think. Because for、mm-hmm. I, I think like for me, I will never say 
EU child or European child, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah> . <laughs> but you know, maybe if I was working covering EU in my work, I mean, yeah. you know, with your explanation, it makes a lot of sense, and it's.、Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I found it interesting. Like,、uh, yeah, I think I, think I, maybe, I also.、Yeah. Sorry.、Um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I think that was also when I was just.、Um, I just received the position of Southeast Asia lead at Climate Tracker, so <laughs> that also pushed my thinking. Yeah. No, yeah, I was wondering whether it was more professional identity, or maybe it was just like identity. Maybe you feel really belonging to ASEAN, right? Yeah, yeah.、Um, I would like to travel around ASEAN more. I've been to most, well, not most, but quite a lot of countries in ASEAN. But I'd like to really have the opportunity to immerse myself in other countries. As well, as actually the plan for my gap year was to travel around ASEAN, and、um, I had some other plans、uh, for other countries outside as well.、Um, but obviously, COVID. So, so far spent it in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I have a lot of questions about your gap year.、Uh, mm -hmm. We'll come back on that. I, I like to do it chrono chronologically. Yes. yes, we can do、um, it chronologically. Um, yeah, so I think、uh, I so I again I stoke you so much. <laughs> I don't say that to scare you, but just really, if I name if I drop like some details <laughs> about your life, and you're like,、well, how does he know that? <laughs> yeah, I just read everything possible. You should be a journalist. You'd be very proficient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, so I saw I, I I think the earliest thing I've seen.、Um, hmm. Was when you were 13 years old, and the,、mm -hmm. there was this I quote devastating toxic chemical spill in Vietnam,、mm -hmm. and you started to take action for it.、Mm -hmm. uh, but again, we'll come back on that. But I just wonder what I mean. Do you have any memory of how was your life? What happened until 13 years old? Like, what were your dreams before that?、Uh, how did you grow up? Where did you grow up? What were you doing with your life? Before thirteen. Before thirteen. Deep question. Yeah. Oh my god, that felt like a really long time ago. What was I doing before thirteen? <laughs> um. Well, again, as mentioned earlier, I was born in Saigon.、Um, I think I don't know if it's still on my bio anymore, but at, at some point, I definitely like aside from ASEAN child, I wrote like from Saigon, something like that, because. A big part of my identity is growing up in this city, and、um, yeah, I think before thirteen, I just went to school and did the normal, you know, school student stuff.、Um, I enjoyed reading a lot.、Um, that was one of the things that I vividly remember. Like I would bring a book into school, like a lot of times, and.、Um, I not a lot of people related with how much I love reading, which was a little bit difficult for me,、um, especially in primary school because I was like seen as a nerd. And then in、um, secondary school, I sort of went to a magnet public school in in Saigon, and then I found other nerds <laughs> like myself, and it became more fun.、Um, yeah, I so I've been into reading and writing for a very long time. Definitely before thirteen, I started writing my. Like I started journaling when I was six or seven, I think seven,、um, which I think journaling is the precursor to, you know, having a blog and、um, documenting your life and stuff like that. So I think do documenting my life and things that were happening around me have definitely been part of just like my personal practice、um, for a very long time.、Um, I credit my mom for that because she taught me my first diary when I was seven. In first grade, and yeah,、um, I still get a kick out of reading <laughs> what I wrote back then. It was very bad.、Um, I also focused on learning English before thirteen because it was a big thing for sort of Vietnamese students, my generation, who want to、mm, learn more about the world and who are ambitious about you know being able to change things and do things and. Just like have more opportunity、um, for education, it was sort of 
a common belief that we had to learn English. And I think people, a lot of people in developing countries and especially in the ASEAN region would relate to this as well. Um, and I went to a public school, so I never went to international schools. So it was hard to be good at English because we didn't have terrific teachers. Um, so a lot of my time was also spent like self-studying English. I did have, um, I did go to some extra classes. It was pretty common back then. And I really enjoyed it actually, because I, starting from the time when I could read more advanced stuff, um, I would read things ranging from, um, you know, Walden, Henry David Thoreau, um, which was, Know, probably one of the first books I read that was very much about like nature and um, humans relationship to it. I also read uh, a lot of fiction. So I loved like the British classics when I was a kid, stuff like Jane Eyre. Um, I had, I actually listened to podcasts as well, which uh, we were talking earlier, you know, it's not too common or too popular in Vietnam yet. Um, but I was a big fan of audiobooks, podcasts. Um, so I would listen to Jane Eyre like every time before I fall asleep. And then I think that's how I learned English. Whoa. Um, <laughs> yeah. So pretty much that's, that's, I think that sums up my life before 13. And then at 13, sort of things came together. I, so my dream was to, apply to a scholarship to study in Singapore for high school because um, for kids who went to magnet schools in, in secondary school in Vietnam, like sixth to eighth grade, or just like anyone who um, wanted to pursue, you know, academics like elsewhere in a more rigorous environment, um, there were scholarships called ASTAR, um, and one other one, I forgot the name, I think it was called ASEAN. But yeah, there are two like scholarship, government funded scholarship programs that a lot of kids were applying for. But then my year when I got into eighth grade, for some reason, ASTAR was um, suspended for one year. I think they restarted it a couple, one or two years later. But for my year, they didn't have it when I was um, at the age when normal, normally people would apply. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do with myself now? <laughs> and then um, fortunately at the time, oh, eighth grade at 13 was also, now we're starting to talk about when I was 13. So this is not before 13 anymore. But at 13, um, I got into a debate team with a couple of kids. Uh, and we were participating in a program called the Ward Scholars Cup. Um, which was sort of like an academic decathlon plus debate plus a lot of other things. And um, aside from being a tremendous opportunity for me to also learn more about the world um, and read more, <laughs> it, m one of my teammates um, in that debate team, his he had family in the U.S. So he was applying to boarding schools in the U.S. And then... Through him, I realized that it's not a very well advertised opportunity at all, but there are a couple of boarding schools in the US that are private institutions that accept international students. And they have, um, uh, they're called financial aid because it's sort of like you have to submit your, I'm getting, <laughs> you can edit this out later if you want, but basically um, I applied for financial aid um, scholarships at a bunch of U.S. American boarding schools when I was 13 and then yeah got into one of them called Phillips Exeter and then the summer before I went or no I think a couple of months before I went was when the um, Formosa spill happened in Vietnam that you referenced a little bit earlier and that was really the biggest like, I've read about environmental disasters before, but it didn't really hit um, until that happened to Vietnam. And I realized that, you know, things like this could really happen close to home. And you can see the consequences on people. I mean, it was in Vu Mang, so still it's in the central of Vietnam, not like close to Saigon, but 
still like it was happening in Vietnam and it was all over the news and people were going on the streets, which is very uncommon in Vietnam because it's not allowed. <laughs> um, but yeah. So now we're at that point. <laughs> in yeah. <time> <laughs> um, I, I, I will ask you a question about this, but I just wondered in general, you know, through mm -hmm. when you grew up and stuff like this, you know, like when we look at your background and experience, you know, from, you know, the first glance, you know, I mean, the first thing I saw was, you know, I mean, the first thing I saw, and then I got more details from you is, you know, like youngest climate tracker fellow mm -hmm. ever, Harvard, uh, you start our Harvard next year. Yeah. Like this kind of things. I was wondering, were you always the best at school or is something... <laughs> No, but you know, like, is it, oh uh, did you have high ambitions for yourself <laughs> when you were younger? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I think really I struggle with, like, now that I've, I'm older and, like, not in school anymore for, for a couple of months, um, I look back at my mentality, especially before I was 13, like before boarding school. And I was like, wow, I really cared about school, like probably more than necessary. I mean, I guess it turned out okay, but I was very, um, yeah, I guess determined to do well in school. Um, I For the magnet school that I went to in secondary school, it was actually the only school in Saigon where you had to take an entrance test and the uh, admission rate was like around 10% back then. Um, so there was definitely some pressure that I put on myself to like, you know, I really want to go to school and I really want to do well because I want to have, you know, these other opportunities down the line to further my education, etc. So yeah, the, I may, I may or may have not have been valedictorian a couple of times, <laughs> but did it come from yeah. I don't know your parents or is what mm. it was self self pressure? I think most of it was self pressure. Although my parents definitely they um, they cared, but they didn't pressure me. So especially my mom, my mom would always worry about me being overworked and like. I remember she would take me out to, I don't know, like the cinema or the mall all the time. She was like, you need to take a break. <laughs> you don't need any more studying today. Um, but my dad, I think, was the one who really cultivated in me the idea that you can study abroad, um, even without having relatives in a certain country. And it's something that I could aim for if I want to, you know, if I want to take on that challenge. And Yeah, ever since a very young age, I think he, um, I mean, they did, you know, send me to some extra English classes and um, yeah, sort of kindled a spark in me about how important it was to make sure that I would be well equipped with all of these tools to learn more about the world later on. Um, and my dad also, he never like pressured me to, you know, get first prize in school or like get into this Um, select a program or that program but he um, did sort of describe to me the reality of how competitive it would be for um, a young Vietnamese girl who wants to study abroad without relatives or family connections and um, it would also be very expensive if prohibitively expensive if I didn't get scholarships so I was aware of the um, competitive realities of um, the things that I wanted to do. So I think that turned into like me setting goals and sort of pressuring myself mm. to, to do all of that. Um, but yeah, now I think I'm, I'm sorry for breaking your chronological order, but I think now I'm at a point where um, it's a little bit scary because I need to figure out like, wow, I have so many opportunities that um, happened because I set out goals and tried hard to achieve them but also I was tremendously lucky in a lot of ways and now I need to figure out how to make it all worth it <laughs> so that's the scary part <laughs> trying to do well in school was 
easier in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I like chronological order, but I uh, can always go back and forth. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah. But since we are speaking about this topic, um, like, yeah, like, okay, no, maybe let's go back to chronological order and it will make more <laughs> sense. Like all, all right. your goals and stuff. Um, okay, so yeah, so you see in the news this, uh, well, catastrophe in Vietnam. So what? Do you tell yourself and also, yeah, can you, because it's, I, I've seen that you, you went as well yourself on strike uh, with other people, like or your friends, but then you realize, I mean, there's so many good things. I don't want to, to take your word. I would love, yeah. Can you, ex can you explain a bit like what happened after you seen the news and why did you want to take action? Um, so I don't know if I talked about this in the article that you read but actually one of my teachers at um one of the english uh like extra classes that i went to uh participated in the i don't know if i would i wouldn't call them strikes it was more you know peaceful protests like people marching on the streets um holding signs about how It was really outrageous that this happened and the government is not doing enough to, um, first of all, like help the people who are affected and prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. Um, also for, for context, what happened in 2016 was in April, um, there's a steel mill, uh, a steel plant in Vuong in the middle, in the central part of Vietnam um, that was um, accused of dumping, and there was a lot of evidence that they did um, dump a lot of chemicals and they didn't have good uh, sort of water waste management um, facilities and frankly didn't seem like they cared too much about that. And the regulation of um, the provincial government wasn't, uh, it was not adequate as we saw like by the consequences, but there were massive Um, fish death um, in the province of Hating, which was where the plant was, um, and in surrounding areas in central Vietnam as well. Um, so the fish death, it was like tons and tons of fish. And then people were doing experiments of like, you know, putting fresh fish into the water um, and see how long it would take for them to die. And like, it was something crazy. Like they would a lot of fish would die in just like an hour of being in that water. So everyone knew that something really bad was going on, um, except the plant kept denying responsibility. And then um, there was this one quote, I forgot who said this, um, and I can double check afterwards, but there was this one government, I think provincial government authority who said, okay, like, of course there's going to be, gonna be you know, like environmental pollution associated with industrial activities. So what are you going to choose? Like factories or fish? And the, the key of the quote was like, in factories or fish, like he put it in a very like polarizing way. Like you can, it made people see that the government's thinking, at least that particular official's thinking was you either have development or preserve your environment. Like it didn't seem like there was any middle ground that they were thinking of or, Um, putting into regulations and into policy. So that really angered people. And that was on a lot of the signs um, that were on the streets during those months. Um, so I was pretty scared actually, and still am to a certain degree because it's still a, a little bit of a taboo topic um, to talk about like everything happened surrounding that spill in Vietnam. Um, but it was common knowledge that a lot of people did go on the streets and yeah, I joined into one of the, just like one of the marches in Saigon when my teacher at the English school did. And yeah. in I mean, I think this is fine if you put on your podcast, but I just, I still don't talk about this in any like Vietnamese language. So. Hmm publication <laughs> yeah but okay. i guess in, yeah it's in my um school like article which is in english yeah so i think this should be fine okay 
De toute façon, elles avaient no Vietnamese subtitles. No, no Vietnamese subtitles. <laughs> you know, um, this is sort of unrelated, but that actually just reminded me, you know, Greta, around yes. two weeks ago, um, wrote something on Twitter about supporting the campaign um, in Japan. And in just in, I think she just said Asia in general. Uh, but the gist of it was like um, JBIC and a couple of um, just like public financing institutes in Japan um, have committed to phase out, like to no longer finance um, new coal projects abroad, but then they were still holding on to Bumang 2, which is a uh, Again, in Bumang, um, the central region of Vietnam, it's a coal power plant that um, JPEG has been involved with for quite a while. Um, and yeah, they are still refusing to to st- draw um, like withdraw their support for that project. So the big campaign in Japan and in Asia, I think there might have also been a couple of people in Vietnam supporting it. Although, yeah, it's um, they do it sort of secretly. <laughs> um, and so Greta posted her Twitter statement about supporting that campaign. Uh, and it, she was quoted in Nikkei. Um, wait, I actually want to search this up. Do you mind if I do this? It's a little bit, it's not about me personally, but it really- Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, and I want to get the quotes right. So it's on Nikkei Asia. Um, And wait. Hmm. Yeah, so the article was called Greta Thunberg Joins Asian Charge Against Vietnam Coal Plant. Um, and she was quoted as saying, Swedish, like the lead, read Swedish environmental activist Greta Thunberg has lent her support to young climate protesters, the word was protesters, in Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam to oppose the Wumang to coal fire power plant project in Vietnam. So that's the lead. And the day that article came out, um, it was translated into Vietnamese by a bunch of Facebook groups that um, yeah, generated a, a lot of heated discussion in the climate advocate community in Vietnam because everyone could foresee how just the use of the word protest would turn, mm. when translated into Vietnamese, would turn a lot of people against Greta and against climate advocates in general um, because how taboo a subject it still is in Vietnam. And I, at first, I was shocked that people were so worried um, because in a way I have been in the U.S. for a while and sort of more used the idea that, like, I'm still wary when it comes to um, how far I can push it in Vietnam. But like, I'm still, I did participate in the climate strikes in the U.S. and um, sort of have this idea that, you know, Vietnam is getting to a place where it's more okay to talk about these things. But then it turned out that people's concerns were very much valid because like literally an hour or two after the English article came up, there were these Vietnamese translations on the Facebook groups that really sort of hyped up the extent to which like protesters meant. Um, And then there were a bunch of comments from people. I read a couple of them and then I basically could not continue because they were being so mean. Mm-hmm. Um, about Greta and about the prospect of having protesters in Vietnam. So, yeah, that was a um, a little bit of a blunt reminder for me of how, you know, it's just I'm I'm I don't want to be like overly pessimistic or um, anything, but I just am constantly like being in Vietnam and wanting to do. Um, work that matters in Vietnam. I think one has to be very aware of the realities and how advocacy here looks different, very different from advocacy in 
um, in a lot of places and particularly in the US where I was for a while. And no, it, it's interesting, like, do, because you mentioned all, like, the heated comments, but, mm -hmm. like, do they come from, I mean, who, who would write, I mean. Yeah, I, that's a good question, right? Like, <laughs> Part of me wants to believe that these are just like random bots that yeah. <laughs> write the comments. Um, I didn't like stalk the people who wrote the comments because there were so many, but um, it took on a very like condescending tone mm. towards um, Greta and also just like like drawing parallel between or or saying that climate protesters in Vietnam are the same as people who like would cause you know would cause havoc and like mm. yeah be violent and stuff like that um just from that one quote yeah so, um yeah it was tough to read people were I guess I read similar things in English right because Greta is also has faced a lot of backlash from just like conservative media in the US and elsewhere. Um, but in Vietnam, it takes on a different tone because the very mm. act of like her calling for the strikes and um, the word protest has such a yeah. connotation here, I guess. So you, I guess in all your, is it some, it's something you think about or you keep in mind like for all the articles you write. I mean, do, do you write in Vietnamese also? Yeah, or mainly yeah I write in, English? in Vietnamese. No, I write in Vietnamese as well. Uh, most Especially of the that... Climate Tracker articles I wrote, all of them were for, like before I became part of Climate Tracker, when I was a fellow, um, I had to publish in Vietnamese media. Mm. Um, so all of them were for Vietnamese out news outlets. Some of them were from for, were in English, but I'd say maybe like 60, 70% of the articles were in Vietnamese. So it was tricky to navigate like how, how best to phrase certain things. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that, uh, that's what you did, right, after the peaceful protest, uh, after yeah. the spill. I mean, I read on the, the... This article was great, but I read on this article, uh, you said, you know, during the, the protest, it's when... I'm not sure if it's storytelling or if it's true or if you said... But mm -hmm. I'll just, you said, yeah, it's a moment where you realize you had a voice mm -hmm. and... So you said you were 13 or 14. I think it's very powerful to realize this when you are 14. I think mm -hmm. some people don't realize this in their lifetime. Some mm -hmm. people realize it very late. Mm -hmm. And I found it very interesting that to realize this super, I mean, for me, it's super young, but <laughs> at 14. Yeah. And did... But I guess, like, you know, so, so from that, um, I would say, like, you, I guess, so what, you could have continued to um, protest, but you decided to fight. Uh, what was, uh, what, what, how did you tell yourself, oh, I need to write something about it? a combination of different things right but like i said previously like protest except for in the case of that um formosa spill in 2016 because it did cause a collective outrage um a lot of even like the official newspapers um a lot of articles um, really good articles like writing um taking a, a critical tone and wanting to call the government officials um, to be more responsible. So there was this sense of, you know, this amount of citizen action is justifiable because of how big the outrage was. But after that, I sort of never saw, a, and it sounds really bad that it has to be that way, but I think in Vietnam, the situation still is the case that unless 
some there's such a high profile disaster that collectively outrages everyone, right? Then it's not really feasible to um, organize peaceful marches or protests and get a lot of support um, from the community to do so. Um, I know that a, a group of around 50 kids, 50, yeah, 50 kids um, brought the school strike to, to Saigon in 2019. Um, but they only got coverage on English language press. Mm. Um, pretty much mm, the Vietnamese press and just social media and everyone like either just ignored them or talked about them in a way that was very not constructive. So I think I realized that in the context of Vietnam, uh, processing and, and organizing, you know, the strikes or public demonstrations um, to call for a certain policy is not, it is in most cases, not the most effective way to advocate for change. Um, talking about the, the strike um, event that I mentioned. So I was in New York at the time. So I actually participated in the, this, yeah, it was September, 2020 um, strikes in New York. And then I was asked by that point, I had only written quite a lot for different newspapers in Vietnam. So I was asked by um, one of my former editors to write an op-ed about that strike in New York and why climate change matters for my generation. And the funny thing was, um, I actually referenced that there was this group of 50 people in Vietnam who really courageously tried to bring the strike to Saigon. And then the editor cut it out because he told me that it's okay for you to talk about striking in the U.S., but you can't even hint at the fact that there are mm. these protests happening or strikes happening in Vietnam. Because And the reasoning that he gave was, well, no other Vietnamese language press is doing it, so I'm not going to be the one. It's this you know, self-censorship that happens mm -hmm. and, and working... Um, and having some experience with, you know, trying to pitch and trying to write about climate change in Vietnamese, um, the official language, Vietnamese language news outlets, I'm certainly very aware of this reality. Um, and also, to answer your original question, it, I did make the decision to go to high school in the U.S. So um, I would go back every summer and it was... I, I kept myself updated on things and, um, you know, still had contacts on the ground and could do and could write um, and could pitch to these news outlets. But it wasn't quite feasible to, you know, organize a lot of direct action on the ground either. Even if um, we came up with more effective ways of doing it, I wasn't I made the decision to not be there all the time. So it became very difficult. So you were still writing from the U.S. as well so about uh, about Vietnamese related climate change like, uh, things. Yeah, so I started writing in tenth grade um, when I was, I think, my first article. Um, I got the idea for it in the U.S. and then I came back to Vietnam and did all the interviews, and then. I went back to the U.S. and like finished it writing and pitched it, basically. Yeah. So what, the, what was it about? My Your first, first article? article. My first article was how um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it had to do with um, how climate change was impacting ethnic minorities in the northwest mountain regions of Vietnam. Um, yeah, so I interviewed um, a couple of people who did work in that region. And um, I think I talked about how the rising temperatures affected crops and people's livelihoods 
also talked about how related to more instances of floods happening um, and yeah, generally how ethnic minorities in those regions already had it very hard in the first place and um, are generally like lacking in mobility like compared to people in other regions. And then climate change made it really difficult for them to live in this place where they've been for a very long time. Um, so that was my very first climate article in, when I, that I wrote in 10th grade. So you had the, so you had this idea of topic, yeah. But you 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 wanted to do the interviews, read it, and pitch it. I mean, that was a plan, or you just mm -hmm. had the idea, and because you know, like I, I I have a lot of ideas of stuff I would yeah. like to write, but I don't necessarily yeah. think to to pitch them to pitch newspapers, it. right? Um. Like, so I had, the, yeah, I had the idea, and then. It's like, I really want to actually write the story and have people read it. Um, oh, I think at the time I was <laughs> in 2016, right before studying abroad, going to the U.S., I organized a model UN conference in Saigon. Um, it was actually one of the first conferences for public school students because previously there were um, debate tournaments and like such opportunities, but mostly limited to international schools in, Viet in Saigon. Um, so I wanted to organize one that was more accessible to everyone. And then that event got some press coverage, which is how I managed to get in contact with some journalists and editors that helped me pitch the article in, yeah, in 10th grade. So that would be 2017 when I pitched the article. How November were you already aware of the process of like you need to you know like if oh, you ask me a like few how years to ago, write right so yeah, how to write the correct article where to pitch yeah. it how to pitch mm -hmm. it so this is where my decision to go to school in the U.S. actually also really impacted my where I'm I am right now in a positive way um, because my school was it's called a preparatory school which means that they really do a good job of um like allowing students to have all of these pre-professional clubs and opportunities to you know try out different things that um would not be available to high school students in a lot of places otherwise and definitely would not have been available to me if i had stayed in vietnam um but i joined the school school newspaper like pretty much it was one of the first things I did when I got to school in 2016 I didn't have I think when I first joined a newspaper I didn't quite like envision myself as you know using okay I'm gonna use um, this medium since I can't be in Vietnam and I can't protest in Vietnam and that's not the most effective thing to do anyway I'm gonna you know go into climate journalism and affect change that way I didn't like think about all of that just yet when I got started but I was aware that um, I, I was very passionate about writing and I was sort of good at writing. <laughs> so, um, and I felt excited about the idea of not just writing about myself or writing fiction work, which I'd done previously, but, you know, writing about other people and things that were happening and um, potentially raising awareness about some very important issues in my school community. Um, so I joined the newspaper and um, it's called the Exonian. You can search it up. And it's actually one of the oldest student run like newspapers in the US. Um, established in 1880 something I should notice. <laughs> um, but it's been around for, for more than 200 years or so. No, no, no. Uh, more than 100. And oh, my board was when I became the editor, I was the 140 first board so that's how long the newspaper has been around so long story short they really had um terrific advisors um who were former journalists uh who were passionate about you know cultivating this appreciation for journalism and journalistic practices in the younger generation so right away i was assigned um one or two articles every week in my ninth grade and was sort of like taught on this job, like how to do it properly by people who had 
decades of professional experience, plus my peers who also have done the newspaper and have pitched to professional news outlets in the U.S. Um, so I learned pretty quickly. And then by 10th grade, by 2017, um, I was getting like four articles per week that I wrote for the school newspaper. And so I felt pretty confident in my ability to you know, structure a news article and go about getting interviews and um, you know, journalism ethics and things like that. So yeah, that's when I, um, I also got the idea of, of writing about climate change in Vietnamese and pitching it to Vietnamese outlets. Everything sort of kept, came together at the right time. Um, and then shortly after I knew about Climate Tracker, so it's very, very lucky how the stars aligned. <laughs> Did, do you have the same writing process when you are writing in English or in Vietnamese? I mean, the journalism process is pretty much the same, right? Like you um, come up with an idea. Hopefully it's a good idea, a timely issue. People should care about it. And then you um, think of your angle and then you think of who you're going to interview, what are your sources, and then you interview them and you write the article. So it's pretty much the same, but obviously the actual like writing in the Vietnamese language is, is different from, the, the, from writing in English. Um, and yeah, I struggle more with writing in Vietnamese, honestly, despite, um, you know, pretty much being educated in the Vietnamese public school system um, for, eight years I still um I when I first started out I was a little bit self-conscious about like oh is my writing like does, does it sound westernized because I started mm. writing articles in English um but then I think the more I did it the more I just learned and and became more confident in both languages and no I mean I find it interesting because I I mean, I, I don't write a lot, but from time to time, I write some articles. Or sometimes people mm -hmm. ask me to write articles. Mm -hmm. And last time I had to write something in French. Mm -hmm. I think I, I mostly write only in English as well. Uh, yeah. So I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> most of the words are like, you know, the beauty, I mean, beautiful sentence, like expressions yeah. I like, I have it in English yeah. only. So then I'm like, yeah. like trying to put it in French it doesn't work at all oh yeah no actually that's also uh, I still write more um, I think it also has to do with how like the English language wor works versus how the Vietnamese language works but um, the really veteran Vietnamese journalists that I look up to they have so many beautiful ways of expressing things that mm. I can never do um, and a lot of it is there is an expectation um, in the Vietnamese press that even when you're writing journalistically, the writing has to be beautiful. <laughs> like it's pretty common to see, you know, descriptions of like when someone brings up a, a source that they interviewed, you could see like descriptions of what the person was wearing or like how their hands look like and things like that. And I don't do that stuff in my writing, but I guess I try to make it up <laughs> by other ways. Um, so I think the gist of it is like, as long as you have a good topic and you're able to interview interesting sources and, um, you know, you communicate in a way that people can understand. Um, and people are willing to overlook the lack of flowery, <laughs> flowery mm. language. Yeah, in my writing. I I read a few of your, I mean, newsletter, but also articles. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, coming back to what you said, you try to humanize climate change stories. Mm -hmm. I really like your, I mean, I don't know if it's a conscious style or if any, everyone does that actually, but I, I like to always start with the story of someone in the yeah, chapeau. Mm -hmm. When... Like you were always writing like this? Or when did you realize that you wanted to write like this? Huh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, in the shop or, or in English, I usually call it the lead. But 
there are a couple of different ways of doing it. There's the dry way of just, you know, introducing the topic um, or introducing some stats. Uh, but I always found it like as a reader, more engaging to um, read articles that start with a person, you feel like the issue is more humanized. Um, it is tricky though, because you also don't want to get too much into one person's story because in order for um, whatever point you're making to be convincing, it has to, you have to have multiple sources and be backed up by facts and figures as well. Um, but yeah, when I had the opportunity of finding one good source that can, I can use as the lead, I try to do so. Mm. in a succinct way I think I learned that also at my school newspaper where especially with the more with the longer articles that we write like the investigative you know long form articles it's more effective to start with the with a person um, I've also written articles that are just you know talking about an event or talking about more straightforward for articles that are less than 700 words I usually don't start with a person but articles longer than 900 like 900 to 1500 or longer I usually do if I can mm. yeah and and coming back to climate tracker so look the the first time you engage with them was when they sent you to Poland or did you do anything no, with them before, before that actually because in 2018 um they also were running <laughs> so I knew about climate tracker actually through um a student organization that I co-founded um that was doing a lot of organizing debate tournaments um and just in general getting high school and, and middle school kids in Vietnam to think about social issues more critically. Um, and then I think in 2018, we posted a series um, of articles. Other people wrote this, but um, yeah, I was just sort of creating the, the um, content plan for the year, but trying to get other people write about um, a bunch of issues, including the environment. So then in 2018, Climate Tracker was specifically looking for young writers and young journalists from Vietnam um, to apply for an opportunity to cover the um, like intercessional for COP in Bonn. So they, one of the program officers actually reached out to um, the, the Facebook page that I co-managed. And then I was like checking the inbox. And then I realized that there was this opportunity. And then I sort of read more about Climate Tracker. I read more about um, what sort of opportunities they were offering. And then um, the program officer, Arthur was his name. He, he actually was like, yeah, can you guys like help us promote this um, on your fan page or something? And, we were like, and I was like, yeah, sure, we can promote it. And then dutifully, we, we did. But I don't think... I don't know if um, other people applied because they saw the post on like my organization's fan page, but I definitely <laughs> applied. <laughs> and um, yeah, so long story short, they end up picking someone else, but I, for some reason they liked my article a lot and they decided to create a second prize um, for their runner up. And then Arthur um, became my mentor for a three month like online fellowship where I would write two articles per month. Yeah, two articles per month for three months. Um, it was from, I think, March to June 2018. Um, and I had a terrific time. Arthur was a terrific mentor and he really helped me with the pitching process um, because even though I had some contacts, I was still struggling a little bit to pitch. Um, and just like overall tackling the topic of climate change um, in a way that would resonate with people. And yeah, I became hooked with Climate Tracker <laughs> from that opportunity. And then um, in December of that same year was COP um, and I applied for that opportunity. And then long story short, I um, was able to go <laughs> as their youngest um, fellow at COP. How do you feel 
how did you how how did you feel and how do you feel now if you think about it that you've been the youngest uh, climate tracker fellow ever? <laughs> I still feel like it's magical, like how it happened, because actually it wasn't straight as straightforward as I just said. Um, there were a couple of things I did think that I wouldn't be able to go, um, even after you know they selected. Um, the fellows and they did interviews and everything but then um oh my god I, I <laughs> it was a very very long story but long story short was I um couldn't because climate tracker has very limited badges for COP um so for people who don't know at, at COP which is the UN climate change conference or conference of the parties of the UNFCCC they hand out badges um, for NGOs. And they also hand out like separately their press badges um, for professional journalists who are affiliated with newsrooms. And so Climate Tracker had a very limited number of badges that they had as an NGO, I think. Pretty much only would cover their staff um, and like one or two unaffiliated journalists. And then... Uh, most of the team, it was 11 people who, who were fellows um, during that conference, but most of them were staff writers um, for very big um, professional newsrooms in their respective countries. So they had no problem at all in getting the badges after, you know, Climate Tracker um, confirmed them as new fellows. But Climate Tracker, basically... Climate Tracker was like, we would love to have you as part of this team, except we don't have any badges to spare. So you can come with us if you can somehow get a badge. <laughs> and so I like emailed, I mass emailed sort of, there, there was a list of NGOs who were qualified for badges. And then I just emailed like a hundred of them in one day. And I was like, I really... Um, I'm covering this conference with Climate Tracker and here are the different, you know, news outlets in Vietnam that I'm pitching to and yada, yada, yada. And do you have a spare badge, basically? And then um, I sort of had very little hope that someone would get back to me because it is very, most organizations only have a couple and they don't have any spares. But then um, somehow one of the organizations I contacted was responsible for badges in the home state of California. Um, or they were called the Climate Reserve, I think. Um, God, yeah, I was, I had no like affiliation with them at all. <laughs> but I was, and but, but I emailed them and then I guess they were impressed by what I've done, what I was trying to do. Um, so they were like, yeah, we have a couple of spare badges for the first week um, if you want to go because it's a two-week conference. So I managed to get a batch from that organization, although I was going with Climate Tracker. And then when I did the visa interview for it to get a Schengen visa, because the conference was in Poland, the woman at the embassy was so confused because I was only 16 at the time. I was a minor. And then they nearly didn't let me go because they were like, okay, so who are your guardians? And I was like, uh, they're in Vietnam. <laughs> and then they were like, okay, so, so do your guardians allow you to travel? And I was like, yeah, but they're not here. So if you want to talk to my guardians, you can. So I thought I couldn't go like a couple of times there were more <laughs> incidents that happened because it was so unusual their time and tracker's youngest fellow before that was 18 um lena who's also amazing but she was i think of like considered an adult so it was easier for her and um yeah i still think it's pretty magical that i end up being able to join time and tracker for the first week of cop and then obviously the actual like trying to cover all these events um, and oh my god trying to interview the Vietnamese delegation was another story because I didn't have a press batch so I couldn't join in the official press conferences so in order to get quotes I would literally have to 
walk up to people who had the like um delegation badge because they were all color coded so i would like walk around and looking for people who looked southeast asian and had the <laughs> color for like de- head of delegation or delegation um and it took me like maybe two days in order to find a Vietnamese delegation but I fa- finally managed to um, find them it was also easier for me because actually there were not any or maybe there were one or two but there were not a lot of um, Vietnamese staff writers who would cover these conferences anyway um, so I think that helped with you know how when I actually found them the the delegates were actually more willing to talk to me than I thought like given that I was an, a, a staff writer, um, but I actually you remember Mr. Tan from yes you guys invited him so yeah that's I first um, walked up to him like out of nowhere and was like hello I am writing <laughs> um, uh, like I'm writing as a freelancer for like Vietnam um, wait which one did I write about Mr. Tan for it was. Vietnam news, I think. Yeah, and then he, um, yeah, he. I, I was able to interview him twice and also attend one of the like events that he was speaking at during COP. And um, overall, I think I wrote ten, something like. Because I don't quite remember because a lot of my articles were some some of them were pretty short. And then there were two longer ones um, that I'm very proud of, one of which was about the concept of just transition um, in Vietnam. And then the other one was about um, how Vietnam is one of the top 10 countries affected. It was the seventh most affected country um, by climate change, according to German Watch Index. Um, and German Watch is an NGO that they re- release uh, an index every year, um, ranking to different countries. And then I wrote an article about that, but also incorporating quotes from Mr. Tan about what um, the government was doing. Um, so those were my two proudest articles from that conference. But there were also, yes, yeah, six or seven more um, shorter, just like, event news event type articles um, that I managed to get published but overall it was a very oh there was one more article um, that wasn't specifically about Vietnam but I got to interview Pan Mao Zai who was um, chair of the first working group of the IPCC Um, so he's a physicist and scientist from China Um, and I had a conversation with him about um, what IPCC, because 2018 was also when the IPCC 1.5 report came out. So a lot of the conversations um, at COP that year was about that report. So I was able to ask um, Pat Mozai about what um, the report meant for developing countries like Vietnam. And that one was published on Echo Business, which is a a more regional outlet. But yeah, those were my three proudest articles. And I still think of COP24 as like, that one week where I learned more about climate change and climate policy than pretty much any other time in my life. And um, also I think further cemented my um, realization that a young person can have an impact um, if one tries hard enough, like, and relying on, you know, what are your skill sets and what are the things that you can bring to the table that would fit the context of how advocacy can work in your country. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so cool. I, I, actually, I have, I won't say so many things right now. I have to choose, <laughs> uh, but maybe, yeah, no, I think from all the story that you have been telling me, I think you, for me, it was a perfect example of, of, I'm sure you are scared of what I'm going to say. No, but of uh, you know your act, like active youth, like someone who no work. So yeah, for me, a perfect example of. No, I feel like from what you say, you've never, you've never been given you know opportunities on yeah. the plate, right? You always had to yeah. go for it, to be hungry for it, but you know, 
when you were going for it, most of them happened also randomly. You know, like yeah, from yeah. being aware of the <laughs> boarding school in the US, being aware of climate tracker. But it happened randomly because you, you know, you forced it by going to so much event, by co-founding this organization. If you didn't do that, like these random opportunities will not come. And yeah, for me, it's a perfect example of hard work and and yeah, you know, like it's as you said, you you were not given these things on the plate, you had to look for it. And for me, it's yeah. such beautiful stories. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> thank you. I actually still need to be comfortable with the fact of my age. <laughs> Because even at um, COP, when I, when I try to interview anyone, like, or when I was pitching articles, I never told people how young I was. I mean, if anyone asked, I would have told them, but Like I very much tried and hoped that they would not ask. I'm actually still not sure if Mr. Tan knows how old I am. He probably does. <laughs> But up until I met him again um, at the youth, like national right shop, right shop that UNDP Vietnam organized in December, and then the first thing he asked me was like, "I, oh, like which newspaper are you writing for now?" <laughs> I think he thought I was like a professional staff writer. <laughs> For a newspaper, and I was like, "Uh, <laughs> I'm working for an NGO called Climate Tracker now." <laughs> I changed industry. <laughs> now I'm with Climate Tracker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I change industries. Um, I, but... I do you see your? So now you're 18. Do you see that I'm, as a? Yes, I'm 18, turning 19. Soon. Okay, when? <laughs> March 6th. Okay. Do you see that as a, I mean, in, in the context of the work you're doing mm -hmm. and the people you are meeting, do you see that as a, I mean, do you see that as a strength mm -hmm. or not as a strength mm -hmm. to be almost That's 19? Good question. Yeah. I simultaneously feel too young and too old at the same time <laughs> a lot of the things I do um, it can be a limitation um, but I think a lot of the times when like I view it as a limitation it becomes one because I think of it that way like I have been in a lot of situations especially in Vietnam because you know in Vietnam there's no I and you pronoun so whenever you meet someone it's very normal for mm. people to be the first thing they ask you unless you know when I'm at I was at COP and just interviewed people right but usually in other circumstances like when I'm organizing um, training workshops for climate tracker in Vietnam when Um, I try to work with partners or partner organizations in Vietnam, the first thing they would ask you is, how old are you? And it's considered completely normal here because people are just literally trying to figure out what pronoun to use when they're talking with you. Um, but then that makes me feel really uncomfortable, especially in situations where I have to talk um, and have to lead a three-day workshop um, with bunch of journalists in Vietnam who are um, mostly in their late 20s, early 30s, some of them in their late 30s. And then they'd be like, how old are you? And I'd be like, um, that's a secret for the last day of the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and then I would always be very self-conscious because I was like, do I like seem childish or do I seem young? Like, can people tell that I'm very young? Um, when I'm speaking and it's always sort of like yeah not like a hundred percent confident in those situations and and afraid of messing up and being judged um, for messing up and I also like always wanted because Climate Tracker really believed in me and I'm very grateful for the type of opportunities and the type of projects that they allowed me to work on. Um, but like pretty much after COP24, um, Chris, who is the director, um, called me up and was like, hey, do you want to work for us? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and 
um, I wanted to do a good job because I was the only like Vietnamese representative of Climate Tracker when I was running projects in Vietnam. And I didn't want, I was like always very scared of people making assumptions about, oh, like Climate Tracker is like, I don't want people to think that Climate Tracker is somehow like unprofessional for, you know, having an 18 year old like run all of these events and programs. Um, yeah, so I think that's where my age really added like more stress when I was trying to do things. Um, I guess it could also be a strength um, because I felt like I have more time to, try to do different things and learn about things um, than maybe I would like further down the line. But it's also scary because like now that I'm starting college too, and I'm like, oh my God, I feel so old. I have to choose a major soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's, that was uh, beyond my expectations. <laughs> <laughs> but but on, on that, like, did, because you said you were afraid that people judge you or think that you will mess up. Mm -hmm. Did you get any negative reactions from people mm -hmm. when you said i'm 16 17 18 did some people because I, i i i can really i mean i i spoke with some you know young activists and they tell mm -hmm. me yeah you know i want to speak to political leader or whoever they see mm -hmm. that i'm 16 they just stop respecting me yeah or they don't care about what i say did yeah. you face these situations Yes, um, especially like after the workshops <laughs> when <laughs> I had to answer the question or um, people also stop me on social media like you did. And it's, I don't hide, I don't try to hide the fact that I'm, you know, young. So if people really stop, they can find out pretty easily. Um, so I've had people say things like, I mean, some, some things are just patronizing. It's not dismissive, but people say things like, oh, like when I was your age, I was only like, I don't know, like I didn't know anything. <laughs> And like, yeah, things like that It makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and then some people would- I, all, uh, I always do that. <laughs> okay, I should stop. <laughs> like, like uh, okay. Yeah. No, like like this. Uh, oh, when I was your age, I was just playing video games. I, well, I don't have bad intentions, but if it makes people uncomfortable, then maybe I should stop. Yeah, because I don't know. It it just <laughs> makes me feel like you're saying, "Oh, I'm too young to be doing serious things." No, I for me, I, I, I my intention is really. I say that because I'm impressed. <laughs> Not to say you should go back to play video games, but more to say. <laughs> That's so cool that you are doing this at 18. You are much more advanced than who I was at 18. I, I say it this way mm. more than you should play with. Like, but I, I, yeah, maybe that's not why, how people feel it. I don't know. But that's a good thing. But I, hopefully I didn't say that to you. when. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I've gotten used to it. Um, and... Yeah, like some people have said things like, oh, then why did Climate Tracker like hire you? <laughs> Or like, why did that mm. partner? Because usually my, in my workshops, I would be working with um, a couple of local partners as well. And then people would be like, then why did the partner bring you on? <laughs> I had someone say that. Um, and it was a little bit like, okay. <laughs> like, I hope, and then I, I try to think of it as like, because mm. usually I've, I've never had a bad review for the project itself you know from the journalists who participated um so I've never had people say oh like that was a waste of my time I didn't learn anything or or things like that it's always been pretty decent to pretty great reviews um so I've always thought of it as okay like At the end of the day, I don't think knowing about my age affected their overall experience of um, whatever it was I was trying to organize for them. So as long as they took away things from it, um, 
I don't, I shouldn't be upset by whether they recognize it as my work or um, the work of, you know, my partners or older people. So, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, especially if you say it after the workshop, I think people should judge you not on your age, but on the quality of the workshop, on yeah. the content of what you're writing. So, yeah, for me, I still find it even sad that people still judge you on your age after the workshop because they should just realize, oh, wow, she's so young, but the workshop was so amazing. Wow, you know, not uh, not, not something else. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I, <laughs> well, we, we're still only when you are 16, 17. Uh, so but I still have so many questions, but I'm also conscious of time. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, okay, so I, I think just to give you an idea, I have one, I, maybe one last question on the UNDPVTM report. One, f one question about Harvard, <laughs> very curious. And then uh, the final three questions I always ask to everyone. Okay, so sounds good. five more questions. Yes. Um, yeah. Ready. So about the uh, report, uh, like we part of the climate dialogue, we asked you to share a bit, but you only had <laughs> very pressurized, limited time. So I would love if you could share a bit about the report that you are leading with uh, mm -hmm. UNDP Vietnam, which was about identifying the bottlenecks for young Vietnamese climate activists. Mm -hmm. You could share. Yeah, a bit about the experience, but also what have you learned through all the interviews that could help young Vietnamese active, um, young people to take action for the climate? Yeah, so actually the report has three main sections. Um, the first one is um, a stakeholding sort of, sorry, no, that's not a word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stock taking, I've been talking for too long. Um, stock taking. <laughs> of existing projects. Um, so introducing the most impressive youth um, initiatives in different, in four areas of climate action. So mitigation, adaptation, natural, na nature-based solutions and climate policy. And then the second part is to identify the bottlenecks like you mentioned. And then the third part is to um, come up with accelerators and a roadmap for 2021 and the next four years. Um, as well as recommendations for stakeholders. So I think of it as like, you know, what we're doing well, what we're struggling with, and what should we do next? Um, the three main parts. And the process for writing that, I um, was tremendously lucky to uh, be the lead reporter for that report. So I got to attend the national write shop that UNDP Vietnam organized in December of 2020. I met um, 20 of the most, some of the most amazing climate advocates, um, new climate advocates in Vietnam from all three regions of the country. And um, together we had some pretty um, productive like brainstorming sessions throughout the three days. Um, the four bottlenecks that uh, we realized most youth projects encounter. And we also ran a survey afterwards to see if, um, you know, more quantitative data would hold up to um, this, but basically the major bottlenecks were um, financial constraints, which made sense because a lot of, most of these youth organizations aren't like registered NGOs. Um, so it's hard for them to you know, have a steady source of operating revenue. So it's very like project to project. Um, and the second largest, obstacle was um, engaging with stakeholders. A lot of people raised um, stories of how, even though um, through the dialogue and through other like opportunities to engage with people like Mr. Tan and um, um, individuals, the national government in um, the Ministry of Nat uh, Natural Resources and Environment in Monterey in Vietnam, who were very supportive of the idea of youth advocacy for climate and youth initiatives um, for climate action. When you come down to the local levels, it's not always the same story. Um, so like difficulty engaging with local government and um, even like school officials and um, in general people that needed 
to support a project was the second biggest um, bottleneck. And then the third one had to do with skills, um, skills like how to write a budget proposal, how to manage a project, how to deal with human resource issues. Um, and then the fourth bottleneck that came up was um, access to technology because some of the um, projects um, would really benefit from you know better use of technology so those were the four main bottlenecks that we saw and then from that on we um, came up with 10 different accelerators um, probably don't have time to go over all of them but um, the two main ones um, that would apply to a lot of the bottlenecks um, and different fields of action that we identified um, would be organizing a youth climate network in Vietnam. So that network has come into existence. It's called YNET. So YNET uh, stands for Youth for um, climate Action Network. So the UNDP Vietnam program was called Youth for Climate Action and then um, the youth from that program like, you know, created a network. So it's called YNET because of that. And yeah, we're, um, YNET has a lot of um, plans for this year. So I'm very excited about what's gonna come from the network and um, more broadly the report. And then the second um, accelerator that we proposed was a climate learning hub. Um, so that would be a centralized hub of information in Vietnamese and hopefully some ethnic minority languages as well um, that would really provide like interactive and understandable um, briefs on different climate issues as well as updates on climate policy in Vietnam. So those are the two accelerators, um, the three like biggest ones. And then yeah, we also have stakeholder, um, recommendations for our stakeholders and how best um, they can support further youth action. So I'm very proud of the report. It's currently in final stages of editing, um, although I am not very sure when it will be <laughs> officially presented to, to the public um, because that also depends on UNDP Vietnam. But um, whenever that happens, I hope that a lot of people read it, um, especially youth, but as um, the stakeholders that we hope to engage with as well. It's you wrote it. It will be written in two languages, right? Oh yeah, it's been, okay. Yes, it's been written in two languages. Um, yeah, I'm okay. currently putting in final edits on the English version because we we finished the Vietnamese one first, and then. Um, final edits on the English one. Okay, can't wait to read it. Uh, no, really. Uh, especially since I read somewhere that this <laughs> is a perfect opportunity to name drop this, to drop this, that you were a perfectionist, perfectionist so you were always trying to get the perfect sentence and, you know, why do that too? Maybe not at the same level, but I, I can completely feel you. Uh, mm -hmm. If there is one word I'm not satisfied with, I will not publish so I'll just wait until I have an idea of which better word. Um, it's pretty hard to be a perfectionist when you're writing a 60-page report, though. I gotta say that. <laughs> That's a, oh, you need a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but cool, yeah, no, if, yeah, I mean, when it's uh, online, I can put the link as well in the notes of episode so that it's easy to find. Yay. And uh, and we're also virtually clapping. We cannot see that in the podcast. Um, yeah, and, and also, you know, yeah, so I wanted to ask you about Harvard. Um, okay, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, you know, Harvard, you know, it's like, you know, this, uh, <laughs> it's, Pretty much, I mean, this is how I see Harvard is like, yeah, pretty much everyone knows Harvard and pretty much everyone has an idea of what Harvard is, yeah. whether it's from movies, from the social network movie, <laughs> from what. So I just wondered, was it, was it always your goal to be no. in Harvard? Okay. No. <laughs> this is kind of cringy, but um, I did read, when I was a kid, I read don't know what the English translation would be, but basically there was this Chinese 
kid who, well, she's older now, but who got into Harvard in the 90s and wrote a whole book about it called, like, I want to go to Harvard to study econ or something like that. And then her book was actually credited for the a huge boom in applicants from China because before that, I mean, in some ways it is a good thing, right? Because before that, people didn't think that undergraduate studies in the U.S. for international students was possible or affordable. Um, it wasn't a widely known fact that private um, colleges and private high schools offer um, like privately sponsored uh, financial assistance scholarships. Um, so after that book, a bunch of people from China like applied and then it um, was translated into Vietnamese and was sort of a sensation when it came out. Um, but I don't know, I think I read it and I was like, okay, cool. It, it definitely mm, was part of like fueling my dream of overall like wanting to study abroad. Um, but I wasn't like, I have to get into Harvard or my life is meaningless, you know? <laughs> and um, especially when I was in high school, um, we were very lucky to be exposed because it's a preparatory school. We were exposed to a lot of, um, you know, just like admission officers from um, different colleges around the U.S., and I realized, yeah, there were so many good colleges um, around. And um, I sort of had a hard time actually choosing. So how it works in the US is you apply. Uh, the process officially starts like the summer before your, your senior, like last year of high school, 12th grade. Um, and then you send in the application um, if you want to apply early. Um, which is usually people apply early to their like top choice school. Um, you apply in uh, the deadline is November of your senior year. So then up until like the end of my junior year or 11th grade, um, I wasn't sure wh what my top school would be. Um, although I had a vague idea that I really wanted, you know, the East Coast, like, um, liberal arts universities but not too small like I wanted um, also to have exposure to people who are in graduate school and professional school like in the same university um, and then actually um, yeah a lot of things tipped the scale in favor of Harvard well I really I've always you know I mean I have I visited Harvard a couple of times before that because my school was like pretty close to Boston um, and I always really like Harvard but also because if you put a school as your top school like you have a higher chance of getting into that school than if you were apply to apply like in the later round and I was just very scared because I didn't want to have a choice that was like unrealistic um, but yeah, I think over the summer, I really thought more about the program that I would want to study. And then um, actually, I read a book called Merchants of Doubt. Um, we haven't heard of it. It's a terrific, terrific book about um, climate change, but more specifically how um, the big polluters, especially in the U.S., have worked to fuel climate denialism over the years. I was very impressed about how the issue was presented. It was like a mix of very well-researched history and um, political science and science and just a wonderful book. And then I realized one of the co-authors, um, Naomi Oreskes, is a professor at Harvard. And then I assumed that she would be teaching maybe like environmental science or um, something, you know, more specifically related to the topic of the book, then I realized that she was in the history of science department, which really um, intrigued me because I was like, what? <laughs> history of science? <laughs> like, it, I've never really heard of that major before um, and didn't quite know what it was. But then over the summer, I did more research and then I sort of realized it was the perfect one for me because the idea is you choose one science field um, that you're really passionate about and you have to take advanced courses and do research in that field. Um, but then you also have to back it up with a lot of history courses and um, like 
social science courses and the idea is to get a well-rounded um, overview of how that a particular science field um, has affected society and vice versa over time while getting a good technical background in that science field. Um, and Harvard was, I think, the first school to offer it as an undergraduate um, degree and um, has a reputation for you know, it being um, one of their strong programs. And there were not a lot of schools who offered the same program. It was between Harvard, Yale, and, and University of Chicago. Um, but yeah, and then I really love Boston as well. <laughs> and I um, had friends who went to Harvard and stayed with, over with them because for the shorter breaks, I don't go home it's too long of a flight so I would crash their dorms in Harvard one of the things that like I think people have in mind when they think about Harvard is it's a very you know uptight institution and people are full of themselves and you know too like obnoxious and whatnot and I also thought so at first um which is one of the reasons like Harvard wasn't always my dream school but then I also crashed a friend's dorm, like Thanksgiving. No, earlier in that, like in October, I think, of, of um, my senior year. So pretty much like a month and a half before the deadline for apps were due. And then I, yeah, I just realized people, at least I knew some people who were just so friendly and didn't let the fact of going to Harvard, like get to them, you know what I mean? So um yeah I think getting to know the community was also a big factor in my decision and no I think it's interesting because I what is in the case of France or I don't know in other countries I, it's a question I should ask more uh you know the top schools many people want to go there mm -hmm. just because it's a top school yeah but, you know, I felt like you really, it's not, I mean, it's because it's a top school, but for a specific topic that you really yeah. care about. And, yeah. and on that, yeah, I wonder, you know, you, you mentioned about all your future goals. You also, I, I personally think that you achieved a lot at 18. And now I'm scared of what I should say. Oh. Uh, but I wonder, like, where, what, what else do you want to do? And mm. simple question, how, where do you see yourself when you are 28? Oh my God, in 10 years. Okay, so I really want to go back to doing science um, because actually in high school, aside from, you know, being involved with Climate Tracker and writing a lot, I also did um, bio research, um, some like molecular bio stuff to do with genetics. And also I did a project, um, I was part of a team, like university team in Vietnam where I was like interning at a lab um, that worked on trying to identify like different genes in coconuts that could contribute to greater um, tolerance um, salt of salinity, which would um, is becoming very important given, you know, like salt intrusion in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Um, but yeah, long story short, I think for my gap year, I have um, done a lot more in terms of, you know, gaining experience working um, full, well, not full time, but a lot of hours for Climate Tracker um, and running a lot of interesting projects for them and then writing a report for UNDP. Um, so it's a lot of like community engagement and um, NGO work, um, which I've learned a lot from, but I'm, I think I'm in a place where I miss you know, being in a more academic environment and doing science and finding out new things. Um, so I, yeah, definitely will try to um, get into a lab um, when I go to school, when I start school. Um, I'm currently very, my work with Climate Tracker has made me really interested in energy um, because obviously energy is one of the huge problems that people are trying to solve 
to combat climate change, right? And still meet the demands of the developing world, especially. Um, so it's a huge like, question that I have so many potential answers, but <laughs> I almost regret, because out of the sciences um, that I did in high school, I was a lot better at, at uh, bio and chem than I was at physics. So <laughs> I also want to get a better grasp of like the physics behind energy and um, like energy planning and electrical planning, like electricity grids. Um, so that's the short term goal. Uh, and then in, at 28, where do I see myself? 28 would be 10 years from now. Um, hmm. One possibility that I have recently contemplated is I want to get, I'm interested in getting a law degree in the U.S., um, which in the U.S. you don't study law as a bachelor's degree. So you um, get another undergrad degree and people who want to go into environmental law, for example, or um, legal consulting in the life science field usually get a science like undergrad degree, like either a bachelor of science or just like a, a more science field. And then they go to work in that field um, for two to three years. And then they go back to school for law school uh, for three years. So I'm contemplating that route um, because I think I would very um, in much enjoy like doing legal work. Um, that helps the environment and policy work that helps the environment. But yeah, I think getting a policy degree is a little bit harder to, I don't know, it, it feels a little bit more boxed in than a law degree. Um, but I'm sure my thinking would change a lot as well. If anything in the past four years have taught me, it's that like, you can't really plan your life even for, you know, four years, let alone 10 years. Um, it's more about having a set of, I guess, principles um, and something you care about, which for me, like, I'm very grateful, I guess, in a way that I um, have, like, committed myself to, you know, caring about climate change and wanting to do something about it. And then sort of, yeah, trying to be open to various opportunities that relate to that field and see where you best fit into the story. That's what I hope to be doing. Because again, like if you had asked me five years ago, if I saw myself, you know, being a climate journalist and um, having a lot of experience with Climate Tracker and, you know, NGO work, I would, I don't think I would have foreseen that, um, you mm. know, but sort of like, things fell into place randomly but because I set out with a certain like vague idea of what are the things I want to do so I think that's what I'll continue doing for 10 years and hopefully in 10 years I'll be at a place where I want to be although I do want to say that by 28 I really hope that I've had experience working in somewhere that's not the U.S. or Vietnam um come yeah. to France come to France uh, I'm thinking more like Senegal. <laughs> I think I've told you this, but yeah, I wanted to um, travel there and work for some NGO or volunteering opportunities um, in Senegal and Madagascar, like during my gap year, which mm. has not happened because of COVID. Um, but I think actually COP24 was when I really had ex and could meet a lot of youth from Africa. And um, I mean, I don't know if I had like any prior biases or conceptions, but I just, you know, I never had that opportunity to meet people like that before. And that it really, like, I was very impressed with how amazing the people I got to meet were. Um, and just... Yeah, I think ever since then, I've had this like, dream of mm -hmm. <laughs> getting to work in Africa um, and specifically 
you know, the countries that are affected by climate change, but also where a lot of cool things are happening um, to address that. Um, so, yeah, hopefully I've done that by 28. <laughs> Cool. So basically to summarize it, you will be at the intersection of, I guess, climate journalism, youth engagement, policy, research, science, legal in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere, something like this. Let's see how it unfolds. Yes, let's see how it unfolds. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, but I just, I'm still very passionate about the developing like countries, um, I, I know it's a rather dated term because, I mean, you know, it can be used in a pejorative way, but mm. just in the countries where things are still not set in stone in terms of how the system works and the legal system and the policy system and, um, yeah, where there are so many potential but also so many things that could be done um, to better address climate change. And typically these are also the countries most affected by climate change, right? Where there's a huge stake. So mm. um, yeah, I don't know if I'll want to go back to Vietnam yet <laughs> by 28. <laughs> um, but I do want to go back to Vietnam eventually as well. At some point. We'll see at some point. Okay. And so we spoke about the 10 year <laughs> into the future now I have a deeper question even if you look at your whole lifetime uh, <laughs> how is getting worse and worse <laughs> so how it, how would you like people to remember you uh, or to know you for mm. well that's actually a hard question what do I want people to remember me for well I think most people know me for climate journalism, right? <laughs> as what we've as we've seen from the like, yeah, the regional dialogue Vietnamese girl who <laughs> who is a climate journalist, although I don't remember her name. Um, and I, you know, I am proud of that association. Um, I think I've been doing it for a while, not a tremendously long time, but it's something I do feel proud of for having had some sort of impact um and i hmm, i guess just a young person who is trying to connect all of the dots and um and figure out how to best deal with climate change and also all of the challenges that we are facing today. Um, yeah, I also want people to remember me as someone who is very rooted in Vietnam, um, in Saigon, in Vietnam, and in ASEAN, but also wants to learn more from the global community and it's like because climate change is such a global like problem, right? Or an issue that affects everyone. So, yeah. You no, know, I used to the term global citizen. I have a very like love hate relationship with it because hmm, I think global citizen also there's a certain negative connotation um, that has to do with like privilege um, and a certain like disassociation with like where you're coming from um, because a lot of mm, the international students that um, I went to school with in the U.S. like had two or three different passports you know didn't really speak the language that their parents speak or um, the place where they grew up in and like wanted to be a global citizen in the sense of, I guess like mostly wanting to um, find opportunities within the developed like Occidental Western context, if you know what I mean. Um, it's a little bit hard to concretely express, but yeah, I, I do think there's a lot of value in being open to 
you know, working anywhere and contributing to projects in a lot of different places and learning from people from a lot of communities. But I also want to be remembered as someone who is grounded in um, being Vietnamese. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I guess I, I am grateful for, um, you know, even though I hadn't planned it to be this way, I am grateful for spending this year in Vietnam after four years um, being away most of the time. Yeah, and to answer yeah. your first, first question, yes, there is from Saigon in your bio. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's part <laughs> of the first thing, so freelance writer and journal from Saigon. Uh, okay. Even with the... Uh, Glad I put that. <laughs> Zou, Zou Huyen, so... So oh, correctly yes. written. <laughs> <laughs> Correct Vietnamese. <laughs> um, so my last question for you uh, mm -hmm. is, so I change it a bit. Usually I ask, how would you describe yourself in three hashtags? Mm -hmm. But for you, uh, you have a special one because okay. you have so many hashtags already on your, on your bio. Uh, I would oh. say because you said you the last time you updated it was seven months ago. Mm -hmm. So if you had to update it today, Mm. What new term would you add? Oh, can I look? <laughs> <laughs> Let Just me share, with, share it with you on the chat. I, I have it in front of me. Yeah, I can open it. Oh, here we go. Oh, I wanted to ask a question about the virtual investor, but I don't think we have time for another time. <laughs> for another time. Hmm. What would I add now? You know, I think I like the list as it is. Is that an okay answer? <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I mean... Uh... <laughs> That's good. Yeah. It's an okay answer. Yeah, for sure. If not, if it's comprehensive already, then <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Although, uh, I guess in a couple of months, I'd have to update it with my college if I, I won't be <laughs> without an academic affiliation anymore. Well, you um, could add Ynet, but... Harvard. Yeah. That's pretty cool to add as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I, I try to not throw in, hmm. I, I'm trying to think of a good way to, because I don't want to just write why not, because people might not understand what that means, or like even the full name. Um, so I do want, like, I guess in, the, in this list, it's not as obvious that um, I identify as a youth climate advocate. Um, but being the poetic person that I am, I don't want to just write youth climate advocate. Mm. So I'll think about that and get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Send me yeah. The, the updated version when, when updated. you update it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. No, because actually, um, I think in the past, maybe like four months, five months, four months, I've um, like affiliated myself as a youth climate advocate more than I did previously because I did have a phase where I sort of wanted to not be seen as a youth. Mm. Like even when, you know, like when I was going to COP24, I was so desperate for people to take me seriously And in my work for Climate Tracker, I really wanted people to take me seriously that I identified as, you know, freelance writer and journal and like Climate Tracker person from Saigon rather than youth climate advocate from Saigon. Um, yeah, because I was afraid that, that, you know, being so... Um, obviously a youth, I guess, um, could, like we talked about this, right? Like the assumptions that people make. Um, but definitely, you know, the my engagement with UNDP Vietnam and the Youth for Climate Network kind of recently has um, 
re like convinced me that yes i can embrace my youth identity mm. and it still works out <laughs> so <laughs> yeah cool yeah no that's an interest i actually yeah i didn't think about this when reading your bio but now that you say it yeah it doesn't mm -hmm. If people doesn't, don't know you, they will yeah. mostly say you are very, uh, yeah, that's a poetic person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, not cool. So, yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, this is my final, real final question, but where can okay. uh, people find you um, if they want to speak to you, learn more about what you've been doing so far read what is one article that you wrote that you want everyone to read <laughs> one article i've written that i want everyone to read oh, i have a lot of articles that I like. <laughs> um the just transition article that i wrote from from cop would be pretty high up on the list um there's also the The article I wrote about Lomang um, coal fired power plant and the um, movement to stop it in Vietnam. Um, that was one of my first articles I was really, it's the article I talked about in the, in the article that you read. Um, I'm very proud of it. Although it was written earlier in my like climate journalism career. Um, so if I were to do it now, I'd do it differently. Um, but I guess people can read that one as well. <laughs> It's an important issue. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, and then if people want to find me, I can be found via very many, very many channels. Um, although, like, depending on where people are, I have Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and whatsapp so i think that covers everything but yeah, my you have email, pretty much everything <laughs> yeah i have pretty much everything because i work with people who use like one of those you know mm. so but my email is my dot nxhuang at gmail.com um and if people i think my website probably still has although I need to update the like gap year newsletters part of it, but it has a pretty comprehensive list of stuff I've written. Um, so you can find out my, find my website if you search. Hmm. My Huang portfolio so it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, yes. My home portfolio .wordpress .com. There you go. <laughs> no, because I did have a, um, I did have a shortened like URL um, that I subs like I paid for on Word WordPress, but I don't think that one is working anymore. But yeah, I think my Han portfolio .wordpress .com probably works best. Okay, cool. So I'll put everything that you just mentioned and I'll try to find the top three, top two articles. Uh, oh, I, oh I, will, I will just ask you <laughs> for the links. Um, no, thank you so much. I think uh, oh. for me that was, uh, yeah, go ahead. The link to the articles are on the homepage of my website. Okay, the website perfect. that I just read out. Perfect. Yeah, so um, you go down, like bylines, journalism. There oh, yeah, are, with, uh, yeah. oh, yeah, with, oh, yeah, with, yeah, I remember with all your poems as well. Yeah. Um, so the just transition one that I mentioned is called uh, Fighting a Just Transition as Vietnam Confronts Climate Change. And then the coal plant article is called Highlighting the Downside of Thermal Power. Perfect. Cool. Yes. Um, so yeah, no, I think, yeah, it has, I've only done one two-hour episode previously. Uh, it has been with Shan that you know also. So I think this hot seat was special. <laughs> um, no, thank you so and much. Shan, who was also with Climate Tracker. As a yes. Fellow. Oh, that's maybe a Climate Tracker thing. <laughs> <laughs> We're great talkers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry if I went on like 
tangential rants at times. No, that's good. I mean, for me, the philosophy is everything. Anything that emerge, emerges is, is the right thing, right? Um, um, but no, for me, personally, I was super happy to know you a bit better. I mean, we've been on a few calls, but, you know, never got this level of details. <laughs> but like never, yeah, I think it's, for me, it's, it's super interesting to understand how you have how how you end up doing everything that you do today mm-hmm. and um and yeah i think just in general was so interesting and yeah as i said perfect example of yeah just find the opportunities just do stuff and yeah just uh yeah go for it and mm-hmm. oh yeah let me just recall Oh, I wanted to ask you the question, but uh, it's it's okay. I can oh, again also put the links to all your presentation from the climate dialogue. Uh, but I will end with uh, with the advice you gave to young people who want to take action as like you do. You said join journalism club <laughs> in your cities and be ready to to mess up and. And yeah, because you will mess up, you will need to pitch for a lot of people to so be ready to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, no, thank you so much. Uh, it was such a cool conversation. It was a really cool conversation on my end as well. I really enjoyed it. So thanks for inviting me to Lifeline. And I look forward to seeing the podcast. Congrats for listening until the end of this episode. Of course, to best support Lifeline, you can share this episode to two of your friends and subscribe to the next episodes on any platform. See you next time.